Okay, so um, thanks for inviting me. It's it's really great honor to be here. Um, and I want to talk about packaging and delivery from seas to Mars today. Um, cool. I don't know what's going on. Why it's keep kicking me off? Sorry. I think I'm having some technical difficulties here. <laughs> Sorry guys, just one sec. Uh, Yeah, for some reason. It's so silent, Alan. Please help to fill me in <laughs> with something. I'm going to keep bugging. Um, it never happened. I can't play the slides. I just quit automatically. isolation of zoom um yeah i wonder if there's something about zoom but let me try restart my keynote again see if that helps Yeah, this is really going strange. I don't know. Um, if you guys wanted me to just, I think I can play it without uh, full screen mode. Oh. Suggestion if you share chat. just a single window, that window fills the screen for us at least. Let me try it again. Um, this is progressing for you guys, right? Yeah, that looks better because it switched. Yeah, it, you should see a white screen right now. Yep. Yep. Great. All right, thanks guys for your patience. So this is going to be an interwoven reflection of the born, the made, and also the global warming. <laughs> Yay, big word. So um, I really appreciate you guys are spending the time going through this thinking journey with me. I'd like to talk about the eco ecological way of living, wearing, eating, and farming, mostly through our research practice. So um, my childhood in Inner Mongolia really taught me two lessons. One is um, the poorest often is the least responsible for global warming. You know, uh, if I wanted to eat tofu, my mom would grow soybean and then grind the soybean and then make the tofu. Um, and the second lesson is really about the nature. Nature is so ecological and it never used electricity. It will leverage all the possible energy from the environment and optimize it for its intelligent responses. Um, and uh, uh, the purpose is for its own survival. So these are pine trees. So sometimes as a child, I would run into the forest to pick up mushrooms after the rain. Um, and along the way of picking a mushroom, I would also pick up the pine cones on the floor. So this was my first lesson to, uh, to actually encounter a smart materials in nature. So you, 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 you guys know the pine cone and uh, um, when you pick it up after, right after rain, all the scales are closed. And actually when you place it on balcony for a couple of days, under sunlight, all the scales will open up. It's a mechanism to disperse seeds. Uh, and the interesting part is if you 
place it back in water, all the scales will close up again. So it turns out this is actually a smart, responsive material, but engineered by nature and empowered and um, um, empowered by, by the uh, water gradient in the environment. So this is the first natural organism I wanted to introduce today. It's pine cone, and it is a bilayer morphing mechanism. I'm going to go through four kind of those morphing mechanisms inspired by nature through the top. Um, so I wanted to explain how we are using bilayer morphing mechanism um, in the lab. So again, a little bit more about pine cone. So each scale of the pine cone is actually made of a bilayer, two layers. So one layer expands more than the other um, in, in, in like a moist environment. That's why a flat scale can bend when moisture comes. Um, this is a very simple mechanism, but then you can play it to an extreme in the lab. Um, I wanted to talk about thermoplastic and how we replicate this bilayer effect with thermoplastic. And uh, I know Atlas is a really hands-on institute. I'm pretty sure perhaps 100% of you folks uh, have used a FDM printer, the cheapest possible plastic printer like MakerBot or Artimaker. One frustration point is all the plastic warp uh, if you print too fast, right? Or if your print bed is not uh, warm enough. And this warpage effect is a defect of thermoplastic. Um, and what is really happening uh, microscopically, so the uh, plastic filament, they are polymer. The uh, chains of the polymer likes to stay in this random chaotic state for its lowest energy uh, state. So um, when you print it on a printing substrate, right, like a printing bed, you actually force the polymer to go straight. And as the printed piece cool down, the polymer uh, chain will be forced to stay straight. That's not its most preferred energy state. And sometimes, again, if, uh, this, if you print too fast, it, it tends to get off of the print bed uh, and shrink it back to a more uh, kind of chaotic mode. That is why sometimes warpage happens. So we basically leverage this phenomenon and learn how pine cone is making its own bilayers to make our own bilayer. So in this case, you print this basically um, shrinkable thermoplastic on top of another plastic that doesn't shrink. Um, you can then, by providing extra heat to let it bend. Um, and uh, uh, more interestingly, you can control this bending phenomenon. So if you uh, do some tricks about the printing speed and also the thickness of the layer composition, you can actually control the bending angle of this bilayer. And from there, you can introduce more computation and start to play with more complex shapes. So here, for example, you can print a flat disk that would turn into a rose flower. Uh, and this is a, basically a, a design platform allowing you to define the bending angle of each region of this flat piece and then you can also simulate the bending behavior and export a multi layers for a flat printing process. Sometimes we call it 4D printing, but really it's about the idea of printing something flat and energy stimuli, you can cause it to morph into 3D. Uh, this is again a simulation and also the real experimental process of how a flat disk can turn into 3D. Um, why this is to do with global warming. <laughs> so if you think about a traditional printing, uh, if you want to print this rose, right, it will take eight hours and there's a huge amount of post-processing time to get rid of the support material. However, with our method, you only take an hour to print the rose and then there's almost no post-assembly process to get rid of the support material. So from a manufacturing perspective, this is a kind of a green fabrication method. You can also expand the shape space um, uh, beyond flowers. So this is a sort of an inverse design um, pipeline allowing you to input any arbitrary 3D shapes and use uh, a curved origami folding model to flatten the shape. And then you can print this bunny flat and then you can let itself fold in heat. Um, so this is one of my favorite example, again, to do a little bit with global warming uh, or at least sustainable sustainability. So we are talking about a self-folded furniture. Think about Ikea has been saving a lot of carbon footprint by uh, shaping all the furniture flat. It, it, it saves a lot of packaging and shipping space. However, when those things are at home, delivered home, you have to manually assemble them, it's a lot of effort. 
So we were thinking how about the, the, the flat packed furniture can self fold on site when it's at your home. Um, and this is a toy-ish sample that's only, you know, um, like a super small table, tabletop size. And then we went a little bit beyond and finally made a little stool <laughs> kids can actually sit down. So here again, the drawings are made of this kind of smart shape memory thermoplastic. So when you apply some heat with your hair dryer, the joints will self-lock and you can get a stool uh, self-assembled. And in this case, there's no balls and nuts, there's no extra other material like metal. Everything is made of the same uh, biodegradable thermoplastic. And you can imagine recycle this piece um, completely. And uh, for the next step, we hope to really push the size of those self-assembly structures. And uh, there was a researcher visiting us from Oak Ridge National Lab, and the, uh, they have been printing really large structure. And uh, one of their complaints was, uh, you know, for wind turbines and, you know, large infrastructure, you have to really shift all the way up to the mountains. Um, it's actually pretty tricky to, to just pack and deliver. So we think there might be a really um, good opportunity um, to sell this flat packaging and shipping and then on-site self-assembly idea to, to this context. And I know a lot of researchers um, for, for space engineering also talk about self-assembly uh, in outer space as well, because you know, shipping and packaging space become even more precious if we think about um, interplanet uh, infrastructure or construction. And again, so really here we're talking about um, kind of a larger picture of sustainable manufacturing um, with this technique of 4D printing. We start with uh, uh, basically biodegradable material, then we wanted to uh, leveraging smart manufacturing to reduce the printing time or otherwise digital manufacturing, print, manufacturing time. And then we want to save the packaging and delivering space. And then once things are on site, we also want to save effort to assembly and eventually this can go back to, to be reused all the materials um, and the products. So, my second nature natural organism I want to introduce is nematobacteria. Again, it's um, the actuation behavior is driven by, by non-electrical uh, energy stimuli. And uh, we are looking into the phenomenon of volumetric expansion here. Uh, this is natobacteria. And uh, with moisture, it will expand. And then when it dries, it will shrink. And uh, people have been using it as uh, one of those kind of natural harvested uh, nano actuator. And uh, so those bacteria, interestingly, are food in Japan. So uh, they use the bacteria to ferment soybean. Actually, these are, if you go to Japan and eat breakfast, and this was one of the typical uh, food you would order called natto food. And if you look at the skin of the soybean under microscope, you will see a lot of those bacteria coating the surface. Um, and that we are looking into basically uh, the actuation behavior of this bacteria. This was a project done when I was still a PhD student at MIT Media Lab in Professor Ishii's lab. So this is when I was blowing on top of the bacteria. And you can see uh, as, as I'm breathing on it, so they will expand and then, uh, and then they will shrink back. The reaction is pretty fast and is very sensitive to the microscopic changes around the skin, for example. So then we came out with the idea of trying to develop a second skin that responds to uh, body uh, sweat and uh, heat. So in this case, um, thinking about from a different perspective, we are harvesting the sweat and the heat generated by, by a um, biological organism, in this case, our human body. Um, so when the um, model is getting sweatier, you can see all the scales on the back uh, opens up. And we worked with um, um, uh, New Balance and also a Boston Ballet Company to uh, develop this garment or the second skin, if you will. Um, and this is a video to document the process. <laughs> Yep. 
Yeah, this is the process we're growing the bacteria in a wet lab. Back then we chose bacteria to work with because um, it was just fascinating for me to think, you know, you can harvest actuation by growing them. Um, Cause um, I would think if I needed actuation or motor, I would, you know, work with a factory in Shenzhen and I need to pump in electricity to get anything responsive and morphing. But here, um, you can grow uh, millions of bacteria overnight, and each one of them is a very high energy density actu nano actuator. Uh, and then you can manipulate in the way that you manipulate any 3D printable material. In this case, we are controlling the geometrical layouts of this nano actuator on top of, of a piece of the fabric. And again, it's actually kind of like pine cone, right? It's empowered by the moisture gradient in the environment. And if you place it on the skin, then you can really almost uh, cultivate the symbiotic relationship between the human body and the second skin. And this is the dance piece we collaborated with a Boston company dancers. And again, um, we computationally designed where this, the breathing scale, if you will, should be distributed around the body. Um, and uh, for the uh, sweatier part of the body, we try to place denser and also a larger uh, breathing scales. Play a little bit of music for the yeah. So uh, later, we also did some genetic modification to the bacteria because one reason to use living bacteria is then you can use genetic uh, engineering method to redefine the functionality of this actuator. So for example, if you embed some um, uh, luminescence gene, you can suddenly make the actuator glow in dark. And this is what we did. So basically uh, right now the actuator, the second skin, if you will, started to glow in dark and we envision, for example, we can make a dancing shoe, uh, sorry, <laughs> running shoe for New Balance. Um, and uh, as the runners uh, run in the night, they will breathe still to get rid of excessive sweat, but then at the same time glow more and more intensively as you sweat, uh, as you sweat more and more. Uh, this is reflection because people also always ask me, uh, you know, why, why using bacteria for this sweat responsive garment? I made this hypothesis. If I'm using the mindset of um, uh, de developing a electronic based sensor and actuator system for this smart garment, what do you need to do? You need to find a miniaturized sensor and actuator that can address each of the scale. And then, uh, and then you need power, right? And it's a whole intelligent computing loop. And I think this could be cool because then we can have individual controllability of the scale. However, this is a lot of energy uh, consumed here. And again, going back to this topic of ecological morphing matter, I think there is a strong reason why sometimes I don't like to use electronics because um, if the natural body, the stimuli of the natural body can already um, um, empower the actuation, um, and actually in a quite responsive and intelligent way, then why bother to use electronics? So imagine the local moisture environment around the skin is really powering the local scale. And also once your body cools down, in our case, right, the scale will automatically close. It, it, it is a tunable system by itself. To, to, to that point, I also wanted to make an argument, these kind of environmentally responsive materials, seemingly analog, seemingly not favored by computer scientists or electrical engineer, actually can play a very interesting role in, in terms of sustain, sustainable design. So let's pause a second. I think you guys can sort of uh, guess where I'm leading this story towards. I'm talking about, I'm trying to sell this concept. Naturally responsive organisms are smart. They embody intelligence, they can sense, they can actuate, 
um, and they are pretty sophisticated in terms of the morphing behavior. So um, this is a, just a, a small library of what the natural analog materials can do. So you can see, even just looking at the seeds and microorganism, they have different, um, different levels of responsiveness. Their responsive speeds are different. Their morphing phenomena are completely different. There is a vast space for us to explore both the physics and also the behavior, and indeed also the interaction modality. So I have two more morphing mechanisms from nature I want to introduce. So the other one, let's talk about the chiral, chiral seed pod. And this morphing mechanism is to do with the twisting and coiling. Uh, and again, this is a seed pod, like I mentioned. So when the seed matures, basically the, the two parts will, 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 will coil and then push the seeds out. And this is a very interesting phenomenon we can replicate with artificial material, artificial system but natural material. <laughs> so in this case, it's a flower. And if we make a flat sheet of flower uh, dough and then introduce this angled groove, we can pretty much replicate the morphing phenomena the seed pod showed us. So here we're talking about morphing food. On the left-hand side, those are the flat pasta we made with the uh, angled groove. And then if you cook this flat pasta, it can transform into this helical form that's on the plate. Uh, and uh, you can also explore other shapes here before boiling, it's a straight line and after boiling, it coils up. And this is a video to show within about five to 10 minutes, you can uh, cook the thin hair pasta and it will transform in a way that are programmable. So in this case, in this case it will morph into this helix. Um, and uh, yeah, why, why, why we want to make food morph? It's fun, apparently, but there are some uh, other implications here. So if you think about all the 3D shaped pasta, a lot of the packaging space is used to pack air. Macaroni pasta, for example, 67% of the packaging space is uh, consumed by air. So if we can make all the pasta flat, we can save a lot of packaging space. Uh, and there are strong reasons, right, why we still eat 3D shaped pasta that's very deeply culture rooted and also 3D shapes carry different texture and they, they are paired with different sauce. So we are not trying to, um, to some extent, compromise the eating experience, but through a morphing material design, uh, try to uh, save carbon footprint during the packaging and shipping. So um, that's, this is a, could be a favorite uh, food type for mountain hikers because you can save a lot of packaging space. Uh, and uh, my postdoc actually who developed this project brought some of those flat pack pasta to her uh, trip, uh, like a hiking trip in Pennsylvania. <laughs> <laughs> um, so aside from mountain hikers, we also think this might be an interesting strategy for food delivery, especially for disaster sites, or maybe even in the future for space travel. Um, and uh, actually um, collaborating with a few food researchers, we've been doing a sort of a, a research study on uh, space food. And uh, one conclusion is the astronauts, when they stay in space station for a really long time, really crave Earth-like food. What does it mean? That, that basically means pasta and, and bread, right? So we are thinking um, for, again, space travel, when the space becomes really precious, the morphing of the food can become um, actually quite essential. So um, again, um, this could also uh, bring interesting experiences for the end consumer. And we also think this could be brought into um, a kitchen uh, and also restaurant tables 
uh, make food uh, cooking and eating more of a fun and interactive experience. These are some of the food we were able to uh, produce by collaborating with the French chef. Uh, and this was uh, basically when, when we made the food together with the chef in his kitchen. And he introduced some interesting flavors on top of our morphing, raw, raw morphing ingredients. So here is, this is a plankton-based plankton uh, food and this red one is a mushroom flavored morphing food. And he was able to uh, basically modify some of his uh, original recipe and adding the, 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 the morphing ingredients as part of it. Yeah, this is some of the final outcome. And this is one of my favorites. So it's a little uh, flat piece. You dip it in a caviar bath and it can wrap all the um, uh, caviar around it and form a cannoli. So it, it is the idea that smart material is assisting the cooking process. And the dream is to make self-folding dumplings, but dumplings are a very complex shapes. Yeah, this is just uh, one last example showing um, it's a smart noodle. And as you cook them for a shorter time, it stays long. And if you cook, cook it for a longer time, it will self chop into smaller pieces. And you can imagine cooking two types of food within one pot, within one cooking process. Uh, aside from, again, it's being fun, you can imagine that also save carbon print and save your cooking time as well. And the last point I want to sell about uh, morphing food, which is actually quite inspiring, <laughs> at least to me, is the idea of saving uh, uh, carbon footprint during the cooking process. I was shocked when I was reading this um, research paper. They were talking about a lot of carbon footprints uh, are generated during the pasta cooking process, especially those dried pasta off the shelf. And in Italy, so 0.7% to 1% carbon emission is caused by cooking pasta. And actually, American and Italy are two biggest manufactured pasta uh, in the world. Um, so uh, there's very serious research papers, again, mostly from Italy. They were talking about how the pasta shape could affect um, the carbon emission. Basically, if you can save water and also you can shorten the cooking time, you can, you can basically save energy. So, so they talk about the surface contact area and also the surface groove pattern um, are very essential geometrical factors that basically um, affect how long the pasta needs to be cooked and how much water it needs to be used. So flat pasta with surface grooves basically are the most efficient geometric geometry uh, to save carbon emission. So if you guys remember our pasta, they are all flat and they are all having groove. I mean, the groove was made for morphing, but then they accidentally also um, beat up the cooking process. So I thought that's like a very interesting point. Uh, I just didn't know, you know, it could even help Italy to save maybe half of their carbon emissions of that 1% caused by cooking pasta. So, so my last story is related to, again, another very interesting morphing organism in nature. It's called erodium seed. And uh, the phenomenon we are looking into is more interesting here. It's uh, actually, I think it's both geometrical morphing, but also robotic, because we're talking about the self-drilling as a functional behavior of this organism. It's a desert seed. Um, and it has a very sharp tip and also a, a, a spiral body. And uh, we basically made an artificial replica of the, of the same, uh, of the same uh, seed. And uh, this is how it works. Basically, again, it's a moisture responsive and uh, it responds to rain pretty ha happily. So here as the rain comes, it'll um, bounce spin and then the power of coiling will push the seed into the ground. That's why we say this is a self-drilling mechanism. Um, and it's rain responsive, right? Basically the water resources really sparse in desert and then they really need a very efficient mechanism to drill it on site at the right time. This was made for that. So, um, uh, 
if you guys are interested in basically the, the, the mechanism of it or the physics behind it, uh, there are a lot of studies to understand how the geometrical coiling can affect the specific drilling efficiency, but essentially they are a coil. Um, and uh, we um, are envisioning, uh, you know, a natural, sorry, the artificial replica of the same can be augmented with interesting sensing or actuation function. And they are completely biodegradable. And then you can also create networks of them in nature for interesting sensing contexts. So this is one of the earlier prototypes. Uh, here we showed, you know, like a augmented natural erodium seed. Uh, it has an RFID on it, but we are really envisioning in the future, you could have all kinds of uh, chemical or electrical sensors. Chemical sensors are cooler because again, I love biodegradable things Then you don't need to retrieve it from nature. Um, but we are not eliminating the possibility of embedding electronics in this case. Um, and uh, it's an ongoing project. There's a really large picture, but we're only one small step ahead. And there are a lot of more follow-ups work I hope I can share in the near future. Um, and uh, so many use cases, it's, it's extremely exciting for me. So for example, one thing we are thinking is you can, uh, you can develop massively deployable um, natural biodegradable sensors for farmers. Fertilizer is a huge, huge factor for causing global warming. Half the fertilizers on the planet are wasted. And you know, the, the nit nitrous oxygen that are, uh, that are emitted into the environment uh, has 256 uh, times potential of uh, global warming than carbon dioxide. So basically, if we can save half of the fertilizers used by deploying interesting sensors, um, yeah, it, it definitely will help the world. Uh, and also we are thinking it's a germination and drilling mechanism. We can use it to potentially uh, right do uh, uh, reforestation for the mountain. You can use drone to deploy massively these kind of seeds. Um, and uh, and uh, after rain, after, sorry, after fire, and you can also uh, potentially use it to um, do soil sampling. So the erodium seed as a natural organism was mostly studied by space agents. So uh, both ESA and also the South Korean, uh, the space agencies, they founded the erodium uh, research because they thought one day the self-drilling mechanism could be deployed on Mars uh, to get soil samples. You know, they can leverage the, the temperature fluctuation in the outer space. So that is really inspiring, but soil sampling is definitely a thing, <laughs> uh, not just my speculation here. So. As a reflection, um, I think nature has taught us many ways to be smart and and sustainable. So um, we 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 see a right rising numbers of soft robotic research, smart material research, hybrid system uh, that incorporate chemistry, physics, um, material science, and electronics. But I think there's something really magical about nature engineered smart material because they are completely biodegradable, they are sustainable. Also, they, uh, they optimize both their structure and also their mechanism for their survival, for the sake of survival through, um, through a long-term evolution. So we've talked about, for example, a few of such um, organism, actually seeds in, in particular. So we talk about erodium, pine cone, we talk about seed pot, um, but we haven't really talked about some other things that are also seeds. So for example, the maple seed, maybe if you guys are fans of natural organism, you know, this spins in the wind and really spread um, in a very efficient way. So their energy source is wind and the gravitational force. And then there are also dandelion, everybody knows, also leveraging wind to deliver. And there are also a very interesting phenomenon my lab has really not yeah, gotten a chance to study. That's the explosive power of seeds. So basically they can restore some um, um, uh, mechanical energy. And uh, when the seed mature, mature, they can push out the seed like a bullet uh, kind of a speed. So, so, so you can then very fast morphing with this phenomenon if you study further. Um, and uh, people have been using this kind of natural organism for very good purposes. So this was um, 
introduced this this plant was introduced in a book called Credo and Credo to Credo. It's basically plant uh, by Normans in Jordan. Uh, they use goat hair to make those plants, and uh, in uh, in in dry and hot weather, so the fiber of the goat fiber, the fiber. Sorry, yeah, the goat fiber will extract the hot air from the ground and all the way transport it upwards. Uh, and uh, when it's cold, this is also like a black colored goat hair, so they can absorb sunlight very nicely to keep the tent warm. And very interestingly, um, so when rain comes, apparently this is a breathable structure, right? When it dry, but when rain comes, all the fibers will swell and then closely touch each other and then becomes a completely watertight structure. And then again, when it dries again, they will shrink and then it becomes a breathable structure again. So that sounds very familiar, right? Uh, it, it's like a pine cone, the response to rain. Actually, there is a name for this type of structure. It's called a hygromorphic phenomenon. Hygro means water, hygromorphic phenomenon. Um, our human hair has the hygromorph as well. Some of them, maybe you recognize more curly hair when dry and uh, uh, or, or the other way around when wet. Anyway, they are all water responsive. Um, so. So yeah, so uh, think about it. I guess you guys have been hearing some of the keywords from the lecture. So we're talking about morphing and uh, we are talking about analog morphing uh, that has the capability of being responsive, being adaptive, being intelligent. These are all the keywords we care as an interaction designer who study physical interfaces. Um, and you also hear some keywords about the type of energy stimuli that cause this kind of morphing that could in, in include water, wind, rain, sun. However, you pretty much didn't hear me saying electricity. So that was intentional. And uh, um, I wanted to emphasize, so there is almost like a religious belief that I think if we can smartly engineer the structure, the hierarchical structure, the mechanism, um, you know, uh, the metamaterial phenomenon, and smartly understand the physics and chemistry, we can engineer a completely biodegradable system that are electricity free. And I think they contribute to the future of human sustainability. And I call this ecological morphing matter. So um, <laughs> about global warming, that's a big topic. Uh, we just got started, honestly, I apparently painted a lot of really big picture. And I, I admit there's a really long way ahead. Even we made our seed happen. Even we can uh, make the seed, for example, the self-drilling seed, uh, smartly monitor the fertilizer, but how we can make it cheaply, how we can convince farmers to use it. Farmers even complain the fertilizer being too expensive. I think this is really um, an effort of us all together, policymakers, uh, uh, yeah, um, private industry academic. So I don't think it's something that my lab uh, by itself can, can deal with, but I think if we don't start, then, you know, <laughs> it will never happen. Um, so yeah, Whit Davis once said, human is not the cause, human is the solution. And uh, I really would love to be a part of this effort and uh, push to the direction wherever we can to, uh, to, to contribute to the human sustainability. So again, for a more technical and scientific detail, especially if you're, you're interested in the computational aspects of morphing matter, there are a lot of papers for you guys to read. I apparently didn't go into a greater depth of that. We do a lot of uh, kind of interactive computational design tool in the lab. I used to say, you know, three keywords, uh, compute, construct, and context are, are really the essential points of the lab. And uh, I would love to thank all the curious minds behind all the projects. These are um, um, mostly CMU folks, but also um, some earlier uh, former collaborators from MIT Media Lab. And also, uh, yeah, my funding agencies. Um, that's my talk. And uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. And thanks so much for listening.
So I'm gonna tentatively stop sharing my screen. Um, happy to, yeah, honestly, <laughs> I'm here to kind of also learn from you guys. So if you have any suggestions, different opinions, feedback, would love to hear or questions. I always have a question. Yes. <laughs> uh, so you showed some really interesting examples that are particular. At this point, you've been through a few of these. Are there some general principles to how to discover these phenomena and how to apply them or to uh, or to deploy them? Is there a, is there a science to this thing, or is it still one thing and then another thing and then another phenomenon until you get to the point where you can abstract and generalize? Um, there are definitely signs. <laughs> and, uh, so uh, most of the organism my lab is focusing on right now, maybe not in the future, but so far are hygromorphic phenomena. But they are well, well understood. And each of the organisms study worth a science paper. So for example, there was a science paper about pine cone. There was one about um, erodium, like the last one I showed. And then you can also study, there are big group, mostly physicists, but there, even within physics, there's somebody studying mechanics of it, right? There are some, somebody more about the kind of microstructure of it. Um, but in general, I think my lab's mission, uh, sometimes if nobody study them, we also try to do some biological study, but mostly we are trying to kind of decide, de decode what the physics already sharing, uh, and then try to think about kind of artificial replica and also trying to think about how to augment it and how to leverage it for different contexts. Sometimes the augmentation um, doesn't need to be constrained by what uh, materials we use. It could also be what kind of new computational methods we can use so we can generalize and even do things beyond nature. But physics, I would say, are well studied, especially hygromorphic phenomena. There, there are something, um, even the explosive power of the uh, seed uh, deploying mechanism that are well studied, not in my lab. Um, and then I want to say some of the, you know, um, the, like the mimosa, if you guys know what organism I'm talking about, so you touch by your finger, it will close. That one was not that well studied. A lot of them to do with uh, hydraulic powers are still, yeah, in the middle. Plant kingdom is so magical. Um, <laughs> Yeah, you know, uh, Darwin was saying plants and animals, they don't really have a clear distinction. So there is still a lot of mysteries there for sure. We're studying the easiest. So it's the moisture responses. Um, I have a question about um, durability as well as recovery. I think Professor Ji Yun um, touched on this in the chat about um, you know, energy used uh, when heating these uh, materials to warp and deform them and how that energy um, can't be recovered. I do wonder about that because there's something so you know, beautiful and interesting and innovative about all these bioplastics and how they are, and biomaterials and how they morph. But you know, the, the reason why there's contention in using them is because you know, they're competing against plastic, hard, super durable, too durable, it stays in our landfills plastic. And I'm wondering like um, how um, we can, can kind of um, combat or think around these ideas of like, again, like do, does the material get weaker and weaker as they morph or, you know, with the natto, um, you know, there's the good bacteria, but because of humidity, it does introduce other bacteria. And, you know, how, how does that come around? Um, and also this is a very wonderful talk. Thank you so much. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Um, and you guys are completely right. I mean, even you just mentioned many different factors. Um, that's why I think, as I mentioned at the very last point, we just got started. I also do think aiming at these kind of really big problems to solve the human, the whole human, the smartest people on the planet are trying to solve these kind of problems. It's not easy. And it's, so it all depends. So for example, the the last case, the self-drilling seed we are working on. I didn't mention the replica was made of wood veneer. Uh, and that way is completely biodegradable. And if you ask for repeatability, uh, you know, if you're a roboticist, you wanted to 
test out your actuator for thousands of cycles and make sure it all behaves. But in our case, we just want a seed, almost like one time use after a few rains, you successfully drill. You actually don't need a huge amount of repeatability. But then, you know, I was reading again books and uh, by Bill Gates and all these environmental uh, knowledgeable people. So they were talking about um, even using wood is controversial because you are cutting wood. <laughs> Uh, but then in my head, it was like this, we have to calculate it, right? Because if we are using wood, that will be deployed back into nature and then decompose and then, and then, and then uh, it becomes part of the natural ecosystem, then maybe it's not that bad because it, I still believe it's better than using plastic, but then I believe it doesn't make any sense. And we need to basically talk to experts and properly do a calculation before we do any field test. Oh, I was about to say, so especially for the seed project, um, we are making small steps. So we are doing like a field deployment in the near, in the spring when Pittsburgh will become a little warmer. Also, we are spinning out sort of an initiative, ecological biohybrid initiative, uh, with the help of Centre, so I would love to keep you guys posted for whoever interested. So there's a question in the chat for Chanel. Um, so the question is, in your view, what is the relationship or differences between ecology and infrastructure? Wow. Um, so. You know, I've been reading this book called, uh, by the way, so my, first of all, my thesis is called The Confluence of the Born and the Made. Um, and I was also happily reading this book by, uh, by Kevin uh, Kelly. So he was the uh, executive director of Wired magazine. He was, I'm not sure if he still is. His first chapter of the book is, is actually called The Born and the Maid. And there's an argument about uh, there's, started to have a very blurred distinction of the engineered system and also the natural system. Because as we're doing more bioengineering, as we're doing more bionic stuff, um, nature becomes more and more controllable and artificial becomes more and more intelligent and embodied nature's logic, such as DNA logic, right? Um, and when you ask me the difference between, I guess, the infrastructure and the I forgot natural system. Um, so to me, there's also no, no real uh, ecology and infrastructure. There's also no clear distinction. You imagine your, when you see infrastructure, I'm thinking of um, maybe, um, yeah, bridges and, uh, you know, houses and tents and, you know, human built thing. And, and when you see ecology, yeah, we're talking about trees. So uh, again, Kevin put this words, he, he thinks in the future, we're still nature but then it's pretty much a post natural environment everything are engineered to optimize because again humans are not the evil we we hope are not the cause we're the solution so how we can still right we we some of us want to eat chicken and cow you never want to turn everybody into vegetarian but how we can find a solution so we can have a harmonious uh yeah relationship with nature i think that 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 goes back to this um sub, very subject of biohybrid nature um uh, like a future ecology per se that's actually something we try to ask ourselves in the initiative in that for coming initiative I had a question. Oh, I noticed that people were raising their hands. So maybe I'll let them go first. Uh, maybe Pierre, since I think you raised your hand first. Thanks very much. Yeah, I, actually, just picking up on that point of the harmony of nature. Um, you know, there, there's another view of nature, which is red in tooth and claw. Um, and biological systems emerge in competition with other systems every solution is a countermeasure to a previous solution, which leads me to think about how one might chain or link solutions like the ones you're, you're building, not just a point solution, but a whole series of things that respond to each other. Have you thought about that? Um, I'm not sure to the level of depth you are expecting, but I can give you an example. So when we started to work on the, like the, you know, see the project and one thing by some uh, experts field experts uh, forest agriculture folks 
they mentioned there's a whole ecosystem in forests, for example. So we, we wanted to detect the fungi because fungi can basically tell us the, um, the, the ecological states of the forest, but then the fungi can also uh, contribute to the growth of the native plants um, because yeah, because they provide networks and nutrition and this and that. And then if you grow the, for example, one use case was if you grow then the uh, marigold plants flower, which is uh, very attractive to native butterfly, and then you somehow suddenly you are both helping with native plants and also you know the insects in that sense, and then butterfly will contribute back to dispersing. Uh, yeah, and uh, boosting up the natural ecosystem. So I definitely started to feel there's a th th there's a yeah systematic thinking behind. Um, and uh, I mean the, the story hasn't ended. Is then if the sensor actually can report back to drone or then like human infrastructure, then people can start to sort of intervene to to help. Um, and then I'm not even talking about the houses near the mountain fires, right? So some folks we talked to, they also basically, they, they complain they don't uh, have enough sufficient alarm before the fire really kind of pushed to their friend house. Then how you can also think about the trees, maybe like a few miles away from your house becomes also an alarming system. If you can make the tree intelligent, um, yeah. There's human, there's nature, there's underground, there's in the midair. I definitely think, uh, yeah, even think about it, right? It make you exciting, but also uh, having a headache. <laughs> oh, hi. So I really, really enjoyed your talk. I think there was a lot of great um, images that were evoked. I think the pasta in particular just got my mind going in a hundred different ways. But my question for you is, do you see the lines between like the lab, the biological lab and the kitchen blurring in the future? Like if I wanted to make this, uh, you know, self forming pasta in my own home, could, could I do that? Is do I need a lab? What What is the relationship, do you think, between those two spaces? Yeah, uh, it's almost another really religious thing in my head. There's no really cheap material. There's no humble system. You can work with seemingly expensive, uh, you know, um, yeah, nano actuator bacteria in a wet lab, but you can also uh, play magic with thermoplastic and the cheapest possible flour dough. Um, and I also don't really think there is a clear distinction between, yeah, home lab. I mean, you guys, perhaps a lot of my students are working at home and they started to tell me, it's not because I'm lazy or I'm scared. I just feel every infrastructure set up is at home. I, <laughs> I'm more inspired. So, so I think there are already a blurred distinction. And specifically about the food, um, so their chemistry, and actually, when you play with the dough, you need you need the dough for more time, and then the gluten network are developed more easily. Mechanical engineer will call it a trained process for mechanical property. There's creeping, there's viscoelasticity, right? There's physics, um, and and also their creativity when you're composing this multi-layer, right? You suddenly becomes a civil or architect, uh, a civil engineer architect. So, um, and we also say it's such a complex experience. Um, there are definitely, uh, yeah, engineers who, who who love this subject, but also maybe you know, uh, psychologist or or chef or you know, uh, artist. So I think uh, it's a really fascinating subject that unites a lot of folks. And we are actually supported by NSF. Having this <laughs> another sort of initiative is called Fostering Girls. Uh, for STEM education and uh, career aspiration. It's all about how to produce standardized kids. So, so, so yeah, so kids, especially girls can mm, um, play with food, but also, you know, understand there are signs everywhere in a, in a computer science or a mechanical engineering program, you can, you know, do something that you can associate well, very well in the specific context you're interested in. Thank you so much. Um, just a quick follow up on that. Do you see 
a future where like these materials become totally open sourced DIY, you know, what, what are your thoughts on that? So uh, about the, actually the initiative, uh, many, so the girls initiative we're talking about, we call it the morphing matter for girls. It's a, uh, yeah, it's a uh, noun. So uh, we are planning to actually share recipes and the purpose is to make it even high school kids friendly. So I'm sure for college students, um, it should be quite easy. To replicate. There are a lot more things you can do, of course, beyond just simply replicating. I think if you're a researcher, you could definitely bring it to you know, more sophisticated levels with a lot of uh, yeah, creative ideas. But uh, I am trying my best to also <laughs> Democratize, I would say, uh, the, yeah, some of the materials we think are democratizable in the lab. Yeah, some others are a little trickier. So if they're involved, like, uh, you know, uh, hazardous chemicals, um, you kind of have to get in, uh, to properly get around in wet lab. But the food and also some other paper-based morphing structures, I think, is very viable. So we're, like, evaluating which ones we want to post on the... I'll share with you guys um, once the website is up. Um, I had a quick question before maybe we have to disperse soon. So in your talk of, so first of all, great talk as just echoing what, what everyone else is saying, but in your talk, you mentioned about like marrying nature's morphing behavior with like engineering principles. And I was just curious with your morphing materials, how, are you able to actually minutely control the morphing behavior such that like at a time, uh, t equals 15, for example, you behave this specific um, mechanism at t equals 20, you uh, perform this specific mechanism. I guess this is more specific to your thermomorph because I noticed that, you know, yes, it's 4D printing and it changes over time, but are you actually able to minutely control like at this time step, it does this at the next time step, it does that, et cetera. Yeah, so again, so um, I'm trying to think in my lab, uh, we didn't, try very, very intentionally to do embedded logic, partly because many other labs are doing so, but it's very feasible. So there's a lab in Caltech, again, very simple, even Caltech, <laughs> I'm saying it. So it, it. You can, for example, all they are responding to heat, right? And the heat is um, like a diffusion process. You, you, you provide external stimuli, it penetrates into the very center, then the whole structure becomes softer, that, that will have things morph. So they are using basically the thickness of your hinges to control sequential mode. You can then almost use an experimental data-driven process. You can print a bunch of sample thickness and measure how long it takes for this piece to completely get softened. And you can, you, you have some pretty decent controllability there. That's just one example. You can also, of course, introduce different kinds of thermoplastic. You know, there is a temperature, critical temperature called glass transition temperature. Uh, when it's above glass transition, it basically becomes softer. But thermoplastic like PLA, ABS, um, TCL, they all have different glass transition temperature. So you can imagine introducing different 3D printable thermoplastic to different regions to have logic control as well. I, I think, again, mm, technology development is unlimited, it's all fun. I, I still believe we wanted to also think about the specific context uh, and then only develop, sort of, only develop the technology to a point that you think are perfect for the context. Um, so it's, uh, it's not about purely user-centered, it's also kind of technical driven, but how to balance both as we're pushing our research progress, I think is very essential, especially if you're trying to, yeah, do something creative. Thank you. Could you um, share the name of that Caltech lab if whenever you get the chance? I wish I remember. Uh, <laughs> if you guys can send me an email, I'm happy to dig out the information and share with you guys. Yeah. All right, sounds good, thank you. Hi, uh, thank you so much for your talk. Like, um, I, um, I know there are many like robotics stuff, like they get inspiration from nature. And it's the first time I do think some materials like shape changing stuff spell so much from the nature. Then like, um, I, that, so I, you know, we are like focused on haptics and I, 
I, I really like curious about the haptic sensation for mm. the breathing clothes one. Like, will the dancer get some tickling feeling for the, you know, the shape changing of the clothes? And also things like many of your works are inspired by the plants. And I recently uh, like uh, read, some, read a paper from Nature and they some, some people already did the robots that can have the interaction you just mentioned that you touch it and the lips are closed. And um, that kind of, kind of like how plants can get the touch sensation. And it's not, you know, uh, plant like the material touch humans, but also how the materials get the sense of touch. I, I want to call it like your stuff, my, to me it's more like sentient materials to me. And another, another concept I have heard about is like they said the plants, especially the leaves, they are not uh, like in, in the current work you have done, they uh, get shape changing due to the water, the humidity. And they said actually the, the plants can get the touch of the rain job like each rain drop, it's a, it's kind of like a input, and that can be another direction. I think can be really interesting. Yeah, uh, I think that is all your ideas are definitely all the kind of exciting keywords uh, our labs are interested in. Um, so, what's your first question again? So you're so like the like haptic sensation for that yeah. breathing close. Uh, Actually, I had my first-hand experience. So I was wearing the garment for a gym test. Um, I was running at gym. Uh, I was uh, many years ago, still MIT gym. So um, yes, you actually have a very interesting sense because see, all the scales will only open up when you get sweatier, right? But then that means they're already sweat on your skin. And if, if the scale opens up and then the sweat is exposing to the air, suddenly it the circulation and the vaporization, the vaporization will take the heat away from your body. So what I literally felt is little cold air stream traveling <laughs> in the hole on the back. Um, it, it was, we never really, uh, uh, yeah, never really went in greater detail to study the haptic sensations, but I definitely think there are some. I bet um, you will have a stronger sensation when there are sweat. So if you just have holes in your garment, you 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 <laughs> yeah you <laughs> yeah like currently we are discussing about ambient haptic feedback. So like we are trying to find some approach like like that can you know uh, get some like slowly and and not gentle haptic feedback. But like currently we can only think about something like pumping the air inside that can be bonky and something like the shape memory alloy that you need to connect to the electricity. And mm -hmm. I guess like what you have done is like really inspiring for us. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you are more thinking of the environmental uh, responsive energy, sorry, res environmental I think there should be a lot of uh, kind of material approach you can you can pursue. Um, you know, the power electricity or electronics are real time control and the dynamic reprogrammability, I would say, or maybe sometimes speed. So I think really depends on what you yeah, what your application is. So say if you wanted to have this conventional sense, like an interface, right, is simply seamlessly connected with some sort of digital information, electronics still a very good candidate. <laughs> and it's really what what your application context. So yeah. for our case, uh, I didn't fully get your second question, but I think there are some background thoughts that's about the definition of interactivity. So human input is one type of interactivity, but when we think about interface in a very broad sense, I was trained as an interaction designer. So, you know, I thought a lot about this. I think the fact that it responds to environment um, is also interactive. So although there's no very explicit control logic or control policy um, in a conventional sense, but you are embedding and programming, pre-programming the the, the type of responses and also uh, you know the, the, the way the modula the, the modality of sensing uh, and I wanted to basically put human uh, into the speaker context of the environment and also the interface um, 
in that sense, for example, like a self-drilling seed responds to natural rain and only germinate at the right moment to germinate, to me is an interface, although there might be no human involved in this in the cycle. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much, guys, for being here. <laughs> it's a yeah, it's a lot of uh, immature thoughts and um, yeah uh, I will keep Alan posted about some of the activities in the lab especially the open source and also the ecology initiative uh, feel free to reach out if there are any follow-up questions too thanks guys thank I you. appreciate it thank, thank you so you. kindly